hitch a helicopter ride, 70 kilometers southeast of Kabul, and you enter a forbidding terrain, once dubbed the Gates of Sheehan. Logar province, on the border with Pakistan. This is Taliban territory. We land at a forward operating base, delivered into the very personal confronting war of America's Generation Y. Most of those now fighting and dying here were still in school when George Bush declared war on terror nearly nine long years ago. The Obama administration has ordered a huge troop surge to finally defeat the Taliban. But more boots on the ground means more casualties. I don't take my life for granted because death surrounds me. It's trauma in a tent as they fight to save lives in this deadly combat zone. It's a personal conflict, it's an emotional conflict, it's, you know, trying to keep people alive. We joined the US Army medevac crews, doctors and nurses, engaged in what can be a dangerous and harrowing task. Welcome to MASH 2010. This is the canvas and plywood world of the 8th Forward Surgical Team. Leading a small group of doctors, nurses and medics are surgeons Matt Heeman and Brian Helsel. Scissors. This isn't my first rodeo. I've done this before. I've you know, worked at major trauma centers. I trained in Los Angeles County Hospital, which is a major place of trauma. And it's not that it doesn't affect you. It's just you learn to cope and you learn to distance yourself. And you have to be passionate to make these people get better. But you also have to have a bad memory. For Matt Heeman, the army is his life. I was trying to say it. No, it's a lot like he joined at 17 and has spent 16 years training as an officer and surgeon to be here. Can you get a big bowl so we can throw this stuff in there? And business is brisk. We've been the busiest forward surgical team, not just in Afghanistan, but in Iraq and Afghanistan. In just 10 months, their small tented hospital has received a staggering 600 trauma cases. Fuck, don't touch it! It's designed to do damage control surgery, which means save someone's life so that they can get further in the evacuation system to get definitive surgery. All right, let's stick it in there. It's about to get much busier. The surge will soon push US and coalition troop numbers beyond 150,000. Their orders to take the fight to the Taliban. But first, they've got to secure the deadly roads, riddled with improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. We're barely a stone's throw away from the operating theatre over here. More patrols and convoys are preparing to head out in their huge MRAPs, mine-resistant patrol vehicles. It's now mid-winter in Afghanistan, and this is usually a time when there's a traditional lull in the fighting, brought about by the bitterly cold weather. This time last year, there was a, a metre of snow here, but not this year. It's unseasonally warm, and that means the Taliban are still out there, laying IEDs, setting ambushes. And for these guys, that means more casualties. When you get that call, you hear medevac, you're not thinking about the dangers so much as you are thinking about that patient. You know, you don't know who it is. It could be a US, Afghan, a child. As the Black Hawk medivac choppers scramble, the news is all bad. A massive explosion has just destroyed an MRAP. Two soldiers are dead, three wounded. Are they American? Uh, yes, they are. 
As they land, the crew expects an attack. On the ground, the helicopters are highly vulnerable, and the Taliban know it. High overhead, a pilotless surveillance drone captures in real time these images of the medivac. Vigilant for any sign of ambush. The Americans have spent $32 billion replacing their vulnerable Humvee vehicles with thousands of MRAPs. The Taliban simply build bigger bombs. IEDs now account for 60% of all coalition casualties. The living and the dead are loaded onto separate helicopters for the flight home. How tough is it to deal with what's going on in the back of the aircraft that you're flying? I mean, you're picking up some terribly damaged people. Honestly, I, I don't look back very often. Um, I'm pretty tender-hearted. Not that um, I can't. I mean, if, if I need to, I do, but I focus on flying. For the wounded, it's now a race against the clock to beat the so-called golden hour. The golden hour is when the person has an injury, within the first two to five minutes, there's a certain number of people who will die that are not safe. The next hour is where a lot of people, if they don't get to a place that has surgical capability and a full gamut of uh, taking care of them, will die as well. So the golden hour really reflects those people that are savable if you're able to get them to a place like a forward surgical team within that hour. Just seven minutes later, the wounded are delivered into the hands of the surgical team. At a discreet distance, the body bags are also unloaded. 520 US and coalition troops were killed in the past year, the deadliest in the conflict so far. But all attention is now focused on saving the living, doing all they can in the golden hour. We provide 21st century intensive care, critical care for patients that would otherwise die. I mean, there's no way around some of these people would, would have died. Too many soldiers wounded on Afghanistan's remote battlefields were bleeding to death before reaching surgery at the big military hospitals. So last year, army surgical teams were moved much closer to the fight to beat the golden hour. You watch the TV show MASH and you think about them trying to make do with what they have and I think that's really what we're doing here. Oh, no. For those who make it here alive, often with horrific injuries, there's now a 98% chance of survival. Your eyes open, keep your head straight. Oh, God damn it. A young female soldier pulled from the wreckage of the MRAP has multiple fractures. For her comrade, Sergeant Adam Sandifer, hit by the massive concussive blast, the injuries are less clear. Yes, if it hurts, no, if it doesn't, okay? We try to get the chest and the pelvis within the first 10 minutes with all the other things that we do, like checking the airway, making sure that they're breathing, making sure they have a pulse, getting an IV in. We do the ultrasound, making sure that they don't have blood in their abdomen. Sounds like we apply traction across the elbow with the elbow flex at 90. Matt Heeman and Brian Helsel both served in Iraq. I'm sure she came down and hit something kind of... They're well practiced in treating IED kind of victims. Like this, kind of protecting yourself and this fractures... And but that. this is a different wall with different injuries. So that's a montage fracture. So even though they're travelling in the new armoured MRAPs, they still can suffer severe injuries? They can, and it's deceptive because it tends to be internal injuries. Uh, so, you know, in my last deployment, we would see amputations, uh, significant, uh, like above the knee amputations uh, with the Humvees. In this deployment, their leg appears to be functionally intact, but it's still a significant injury inside, and so it's actually sometimes a little bit harder to figure out. When you guys landed, you went up in the air like this and you come straight back down? Yes. And then... Did it stay on its wheels the whole time or did it roll oh, over? Oh no, 
I just felt like the inside of the compartment coming apart. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out so I know what to look for in people's injuries. Everybody in here looks like they're doing okay, all right? So you just hang tight. I got the arm. Without the MRAPs, the toll would be much higher. So she has an ulnar fracture? Most of the soldiers that come in now after extremely violent, huge IEDs that leaves huge craters that would normally have killed them or maimed them, I would say most of them walk away now. Adam Sandifer is released to contemplate the random nature of war. Why he lived and two friends in the same vehicle died. The dead are laid out in the foyer. Those gathered are stilled by anger and shock. The grieving and a dignified flag-draped send-off will follow. Out on the flight line, the medivac crews are back on standby. Acting commander is 27-year-old Captain Nissa Brodman a graduate of the elite West Point Military Academy. I do prefer the humanitarian aspect. For me, it's what I really feel drawn to. I did go to West Point. I actually wanted to be a doctor. Um, <laughs> my class rank wasn't high enough to become a doctor, which actually ends up being a blessing because when I branched aviation and uh, in flight school, rebranched to medical service to fly medevac because I that's what I really wanted to fly and um, here we are. I'm pretty spiritual and every Saturday night I go to mass. It's my way of dealing with that so you definitely contemplate it. It's in your face all the time. So line up here. I'm gonna start lining up. I would say I'm the mom. She lined me up. I get teased a little bit about being the mom. I'm lined up Carl. But I think that's a good thing. I mean I, I do my best to, to care for the, the people I work for, you know? We all get the letters once a week or so. We usually pick out every now and then a good one and hang it up. What does it say? Thank you for fighting for our country, even though it may mean death. <laughs> <laughs> He's in fifth grade. <laughs> I got real lucky getting put here. Devin Bundy was barely out of the fifth grade himself when it all started back on 9-11. Now he's part of the Gen Y army that's inherited the war on terror. He's our youngest soldier in the platoon. He's a combo guy. So he makes sure that we receive every mission. How, how old are you? 19. Yeah. And uh, how long have you been in the army for? A little under two years now. And you're here already? Mm -hmm. yeah. what, do you, what do your parents make of that? <sighs> they weren't thrilled, but... They got over it now. There's little time for reflection. The medivac crews are soon back in action. A US patrol has found 16-year-old Muhammad lying in a ditch, critically injured with a gunshot wound to the hip. Like he's bleeding a little bit more, okay. but uh, as far as pain-wise, he doesn't seem to be too bad. All right, sounds good. The medics are wary and with good reason. In Kabul recently, the Taliban rigged an ambulance as a car bomb. Another suicide attacker posed as a doctor. Why is he brought to this tent? He's brought here just because he's not a US citizen, so we strip them all down, make sure there's no unexploded ordnance. The people are important, but also the equipment, because we can't replace the equipment, so we try and make sure that they're all good to go before we take them inside. That's a potential threat, is it? It is, you just never know. News that Mohammed was shot by Afghan police worries the surgical team commander, Captain Ben Wilhelm. Wait a minute, so he's from Ghazni, but he also said he's from Logar. Now we said that I'm from Ghazni. Yeah, the, the I think he was shocked. He said uh -huh. that I'm from Logar. Uh -huh. His valid name is Kalaher. Kalaher. And my alarm bells are just going off. What concerns you about this case? Well, when they're iffy on the information, it could mean any number of things. It could be completely innocent, it could be just the pain talking, but on the other hand, it could be he was doing something he shouldn't have been doing, that's how he got shot. So 
Potentially. Potentially. Taliban. Potentially. I mean, it, <laughs> there's plenty of illegal activities that go on in Afghanistan that have nothing to do with the Taliban, too. I mean, he could have been running drugs or whatever else. He's clear. He doesn't pose any immediate danger to us. I mean, we're going to take care of him just like we would a U.S. soldier, but it sets off alarm bells when they don't seem to either know where they're coming from or don't seem to have a consistent story. We've had a number of enemy prisoners of war come through, confirmed Taliban. We've had some that were shot by our guys. We've had a few that have blown themselves up uh, planting IEDs. This is what happens when you've got third grade education. You're dealing with highly technical explosives. It is difficult, but you have to, again, find a positive way to deal with that. You have to set any kind of emotional animosity you have aside and see them not as the enemy, but as a patient. And that person needs your help right now. So we had multiple small bowel injuries, and we tried to figure out where we could combine those together. Get the GIA. What we've learned really in the last decade as a community is that just removing the contamination and not actually trying to fix it definitively at the first operation actually allows patients to do even better. It turns out Muhammad is no insurgent, just a boy caught in the crossfire. His only lucky break that he was brought here. And a little bit of a ride. In much of Afghanistan, advanced medical care is non-existent, with hospital infection rates so high that to be admitted can be a death sentence. For our local nationals, we have less capability of moving them to another facility for definitive care. And we recognize that we probably provide the best definitive care here. Coffee's over here by the blood. Thank you. <laughs> This is a war fought 24 hours a day. Poor night visibility has grounded the combat helicopters, but Medivac flies regardless, and we tag along. Saving lives sometimes means flying blind. We return to where the MRAP was destroyed earlier in the day. The Taliban have since fired rockets at a crew sent to recover the wrecked vehicle. A combat engineer has been accidentally sprayed in the face with battery acid. In the dark, it's impossible to assess his injuries. He's delivered to the surgical team. Gently relax your eyes for a second. Where at the end of what's been a very long hellish day, there's finally some good news. He'll make a full recovery. Feels like I'm drowning. <laughs> this does not go on Facebook. Hey, heart. I say again, there will be a controlled detonation in approximately 10 minutes outside the bomb. out here just beyond the helipad and the hospital lies the future. A year ago this was an outpost of fewer than 300 troops. Already there are 2,000 in this camp and in not long from now there'll be anything up to 20,000, all part of the surge. Already the Americans are building a runway that'll soon be able to land long distance jets and there are very permanent structures now being constructed all around the compound. You really do get the impression that the Americans will be in Afghanistan for a long time to come. And one of the toughest battles ahead lies in winning the hearts and minds. Last year was the deadliest for civilians, with more than 2,400 killed. US medical support for Afghans is intended as a morale booster. 40% of the casualties treated by the surgical team are Afghan troops or local civilians. But this American goodwill takes a battering every time a boy such as 14-year-old Arif becomes a statistic. And be warned, this is confronting. He said that American patrol and Afghan national patrol, they are coming and they're violent. 
and the children playing with a stone together and they threw out a stone on on them. Suddenly the national army attacked on him and they shot so the patrol shot him for throwing stones. Yeah. Not American people, Afghan people. With the Americans. Yeah. yeah. Arif was shot six months ago. Every week since then, his brother has brought him in for treatment. His initial entry of his wound was through his arm here. He has a broken arm here, and that's really the only thing that hurts him right now. So if you touch his arm at all, that's what bothers him. And then the wound went into his chest and then in his spine. So he's paralyzed from about here down. I'm afraid that it's probably a terminal thing. We try and make it as comfortable for him as we can. I mean, these wounds are pretty devastating wounds. For the doctors, Sanctuary lies behind a plywood door. This is their escape from the relentless stress of surgery. Afghanistan is left behind outside the tent. This is home. Sort of Mardi Gras on drugs. I think it's holidays gone bad in here. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to decompress. Like the other night, we were in there operating for 12 hours, and we came back and watched a couple episodes of a TV show just to kind of unwind so you can go to sleep. I have this fire hat that was from his second birthday, and uh, I have some other knickknacks uh, that my wife sent, um, and uh, some of the pictures that she sent me underneath. So that's what keeps me going. The tent is packed with reminders of life at home. And not surprisingly, it's here, away from the hard focus of saving lives, that raw emotion can surface. You know that there's US trauma coming in, and when the medevac helicopter lands, and, and, and you see the soldiers sort of uh, uh, turn, you know, uh, congregate and sort of be worried about, uh, worried about them, because you know they're worried about them as, as, as their brother, or is, it, is it one of their friends? I think that makes it really difficult. It also makes it really rewarding because I feel confident that we've taken care of people as best we can and have gotten them to a point where if they were able to be saved, we were able to save them. Ahead lies a hot, even deadlier summer. As the surge begins, one former American commander estimates US casualties will be as high as 500 a month. I'm dreading it just to the hope that we can keep up. Hope that we have enough crews for every wounded soldier out there. So our biggest worry is that we don't have enough guys or enough crew members or enough aircraft to perform our mission. Another day, another medivac. We join Nissa Brodman on a mission to evacuate an American soldier with spinal injuries. Combat stress, pressure of constant deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan are taking their toll. Most of these young soldiers joined up after 9-11, expecting to fight. They believe this is a just war. But you do sense a deep war weariness, now permeating through the ranks of America's Gen Y Army. I hope that there's an end in sight. Because why else are we doing this? I mean, if it's just going to go on and on. What's with the bot? Kind of, we used to just sit around and enjoy it and kind of talk and helps decompress a little bit. <laughs> yes! That's what she said. Matt Heeman is a career officer, passionate about surgery and the army. All new body by Victoria, 25% off. But he now openly questions the direction of the war. This is what we're fighting for over here. I'm enormously proud to be here. Having said that, I think that in terms of the objectives of the war, I always felt that I supported whatever the president would say, and I would go here. And I know that I have a clear mission as a physician, as a surgeon, to put soldiers back together again. I'm not sure that it's always been uh, communicated in a, in a way that all of us can understand what, why we're, what we're doing here uh, in both Afghanistan and Iraq. So get the spurs, get the spurs out, honey. <laughs> I think it's clear that the overall picture makes sense of, okay, we were attacked and this is the place where the attack emanated from. 
But in terms of what we're doing here now, it's not clear to me that we have an overall endpoint that makes sense to me. And if it doesn't make sense to me, then does it make sense to the average soldier that's going out there and, and risking their life? But while ever soldiers continue to risk their lives, the medics will be here to save them. The radio alert, a reminder that the war drags on relentlessly. It's a medevac request, so we just started having fun. <laughs> so I guess we'll be back to work here pretty soon. Just have to figure out how to put this thing out. Does anybody have a fire extinguisher?